أعيد أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات آمالنا ما يحده الله فلا مدل له وما يدلل فلا حادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده رسوله أما بعد رب الشيخ لصدري ويسر لي أمري وأخلو الأكثر من لساني يفكه قولي ربي زدني الماء آمين Can everybody hear me okay? Alhamdulillah. Okay, what I'm going to do is um, I'm going to um, ask you guys not to chat anymore, inshallah, for the rest of the thing until we get to questions. Unless it's an emergency, please try to refrain from it so this way everyone can focus, inshallah, to the lecture. All right. In the name of Allah, the most gracious, the most magnificent, all praise is due to Allah, Lord of the universe. We praise Him and we seek His help and His forgiveness and we seek His protection from the curse Satan. Whomever Allah guides will never be misguided. And whomever He allows to be misguided will never be guided. I bear witness that there is no deity worthy of worship except Allah who is one alone and has no partners. And I bear witness that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa is His servant and messenger. May the blessings of Allah be upon him, his family, his companions, and the righteous who follow them until the day of judgment. Ameen. All right, so we're going to get started with what is haya? What is haya? And why this talk is so important in our lives, inshallah. The Prophet sallallahu said, haya is, he said, faith, belief consists of more than 60 branches. And haya, the term haya covers a large number of concepts which are to be taken together. Amongst them are self-respect, modesty, bashfulness, shyness, again, and self-respect, shame, honor. These are all part of faith. So, as we're listening to this, right, um, this, I start off with this hadith because I wanted you to uh, see the depths of haya. Haya is not something like what most people think is just, you know, the woman wearing hijab and the men lowering their gaze. This is what the majority of people take the term haya to be. But haya is so much more than that and we're going to go into it a little bit deeper. Um, and today's topic, it's really, really important because it can really lead us to Jannah should we follow the advice of the Prophet and his companions of the Allah. When, when, when we think of it, we want to really, really think of it in a broader term, again, not just into, okay, men lower your gaze and women wear hijab and dress modestly. It's beyond that. And so, inshallah, I hope today's lecture is going to help to identify it more. So, now you have to understand that there is... Um, Many of the ulama have come up and said that there is actually good haya and there's bad haya. And to really, really understand this, well, you know, that's, I, I would say it's a whole other lecture. So I'm not going to go into the depths of that, but I want you to know that there is a difference between them, right? However, um, as for today's class, I want you to think about, you know, in the terms of the good haya. And the less we have of it, the weaker our iman is. In Islam, haya is supposed to help us avoid falling into situations which are not good for us. It's supposed to help us remember that Allah is always watching us, whether it's in our speech, way of speaking, relationship with um, not only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but relationship with everyone around us. And there's so much more to it. So, Bismillah. The Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa said, Haya will not bring anything except good. Haya will not bring anything except good. As a believer, we know that having haya is a great characteristic to have. It's one we should all be proud of and continue working on. And I personally know, living in the West, living in the U.S., it's the opposite. We are constantly told that we should be more outgoing, we should be more social, we should be more assertive and aggressive, and we should be like everywhere. And those who are shy and are mo who are modest, they actually look down upon. They actually be like, oh, they're antisocial and they want to be around us. And so they look down upon that. But really, that's not the case for this in Islam, you know? In Islam, it's the opposite. And we really um, can't appreciate haya until we really understand our deen. And I know personally for myself, like growing up, um, I did have the personality of where I was outgoing and I was social. And I remember speaking to my daughter about this a few days ago. And I said, I said, you know, at the end of the day, I said, you know, while in the West that was such a great thing to have, I feel like I probably got me in more trouble than it did good for me. And so it's 
really, really um, better to be on the other side, subhanAllah. Okay, so the Prophet وسلم, he passed by a man who was admonishing his brother regarding Hayat, and he was saying, you're very shy, and I'm afraid that that might harm you. On that, the Prophet وسلم, said, leave him, for Hayat is part of faith. So my dear sisters and brothers, subhanAllah, this hadith proves to us that shyness is such a good quality to possess and that men may also have this quality. As sisters, as women do, men may also have it. And it's good. It's not a bad thing. And, you know, um, the hadith of the Prophet وسلم, when he says that, you know, the majority of people who will be in hellfire will be females, right? And the biggest reason, obviously, one of the biggest reasons is because of their tongue, right? So you think if a sister or a brother is shy and speaking and, you know, um, saying the wrong things and they're controlling, they're guarding their time, I mean, do you think that, inshallah, we're going to go the wrong path? Something to really, really reflect on. So today I'm going to go over three different points with you guys. I'm going to go over, number one, hayat in our speech, hayat in our dressing, and as well as hayat in our behavior. I think all three of them are really, really important, and I want you guys to get a feel for them. The Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa said, Indeed, from the teachings of the first prophets which has reached you, is if you do not have shyness, then you do as you please. And this is exactly what we see in the world today, that if we don't have haya, we do whatever we desire. It's only when we have haya and we're shy, especially from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if we're shy of doing something and knowing that he's watching us and he, you know, aware of it and he's, totally like it's going to be you know disappointed in us like that's it really can help stop us and control us so really um if we don't have shyness then we don't care we do whatever we want to do we say whatever we want to say we dress the way we want to dress and it's like there's no limit so um with these three points to show i'm going to go a little bit in depth with them okay and um, if you think Okay, Uthman ibn Affan anhum said, if you think haya is only for women, don't forget um, the companion with the most haya was Uthman ibn Affan anhum. Okay, no, he didn't say that. I'm sorry. This was <laughs> me trying to read that to you. Um, if you guys don't know of his story, there's many of them, and I'll come and talk about it in a minute, but, you know, Uthman ibn Affan, I think, was the most, of the male companions, was the one with the most haya, radiallahu anhum. He was just... I mean, even the angels were embarrassed of him. So subhanAllah, like, think think about how much modesty he had, mashallah. And that is, this is not just for sisters, but it's for brothers as well. It's important that they too understand it. You know, um, so I'm going to go over a um, uh, scenario of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa talking to one of his companions. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said, you know, to one of his companions, be bashful before Allah according to his right to modesty before him. And they said, O oh, Messenger of Allah, verily we are shy, praise be to Allah. He said, that is not it. Modesty before Allah, according to his right to modesty, is that you protect your mind in what it learns, your stomach in what it ingests, and remember death and tribulations attached to it. And whoever wishes for the hereafter leaves the dormant of this life. So whoever does all this is truly, truly bashful in front of Allah, Zawajal, according to his right and modesty. And this was in, at the Midi. So when you hear this, you know that modesty and shame applies to every aspect of our life, every aspect of our life. And awareness, again, awareness and having taqwa of Allah's presence in the fact that we know Allah's watching us. He's aware of everything we're doing. This truly can help us be bashful. This can help us haya. Because when we know that our bosses are looking at us, we don't sit there and, you know, go and lollygag on the computer or waste more time or do that. We act our best, you know. So it's the same with this, you know. When we can imagine that my Lord is watching me right now, should I really be doing this or should I be really wasting my time on this or should I really be talking to this person about this, then it really helps us to change what we're doing. And it inspires us to get away from the evil and go towards the good, inshallah ta'ala. Okay. And of course, the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam said, "Modesty is from faith, and the faith is in paradise." And he has so many hadiths on this, mashallah. You know, and it's so important.
that we remember these constantly. You know, so we've got now we're gonna talk about hayat in our speech, right? The Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa said, the Muslim is one who's the Muslim is the one who from whose tongue and hand other Muslims are safe. Right? And um this is something I feel like we really, really, really need to all work on tremendously. I mean, in the fact that, you know, we know this and we've heard it and we know that the Prophet ﷺ said, speak good or remain silent, yet I feel when it comes down to actually applying it, we're very weak, awud billah, we're very weak. So when we think about hayah in our speech, right, we actually think before we speak. We think about our tone, our pitch, our loudness, our attitude. We think about all of it. You know, and I'll be honest with you, there are some people that we can speak to and we're, we know that either they might, how should I say the word, they might either, you know, try to um, argue with us or they might try to say things that aren't true or they might try to bring some kind of fitna. And there's some people like that, whether they're your, um, friends or family members, you know, some people have these qualities. So when you're about to speak to someone like that, and, and I do this all the time, subhanAllah, when I actually say my du'as before I even go speaking to them. And the reason for that is, is so that, um, you know, you can sit there literally connect to going back to Allah and saying, Ya Allah, please help me, as I'm about to face a test with someone, and I don't want to say the wrong thing to them. I don't want to say the wrong thing to them. I don't want you to be angry with me. So please give me proper words, proper etiquette, proper um, way of speaking, and help me do this, you know, um, the right way. So with that being said, you know, um, you come back and you um, start again, and you go in in a way I feel like with the blessings of Eliza, which I'll, because you remember Allah subhanahu wa taala. You're applying what he's saying, and then, you know, you're going in, and you're about to be tested, and then, inshallah, it'll, it'll be easy on you, okay? Um, so, with that being said, um, sisters, if you guys don't mind, please, um, no more chatting. I'd like to leave that till the end. If you guys have any questions, please write it down on paper. At the end, inshallah, you can ask it, and we'll go discuss it. So, this way, we don't get everyone, um, yeah, that's what I was thinking. Let's see if we can dis disable chat. Okay, I, I, I don't have access to that, but if they can disable chat, that would be great. I think that might help to just pause everyone. Okay, so anyways, coming back down to it. Okay, bear with me. All right, bismillah rahman rahim. Um, so coming back down to it, so, you know, um, we have to really, really, really be shy, especially in our speaking. We have to be shy in saying bad things or using bad language. Shy of our Eliza Wajal, you know, shy of displeasing him. And if we've spoken in a manner that was wrong and incorrect, then we should feel ashamed in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We shouldn't feel proud and happy. And this is really, really important because, um, we, I see, especially, you know, on Facebook and you see social media and people think when they're not face-to-face, -face, it's different. But you can see them going on these sites and, you know, something's funny. Something's funny and they um, sit there and actually um, use profanity as a way of having fun with it. And they'll use bad words or, you know, say, and, and it's just like funny to them. So they, they don't think anything of it. But I honestly find it disgusting. I find it disgusting, and I find it like they have, you know, are they not afraid of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Are they not embarrassed to use those words in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Forget your family, your husband, your wife, your kids, but, you know, are they not? Because a lot of times you'll see parents will not use foul language or, you know, won't talk about certain subjects in front of their children. Right, because they're embarrassed and they don't want their kids to learn this. But yet, Allah, when it comes to other times, they don't mind because they're like, okay, my kids are not here. But our standards need to be higher than that. Our standards need to be um, that we don't do this in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at all times. Not just in front of our kids or in front of our parents or someone we're embarrassed of. 
It should be, we should speak in a manner that's proper and intelligent at all times and in a manner that will please our Lord. Because only then, inshallah, will what we say be used as good deeds for us and not bad deeds, inshallah. And if we do make a mistake, we obviously we need to repent immediately and really think about what we've done wrong. Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu said that I heard the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa saying, a person utters a word thoughtlessly without thinking about it being good or not. And as a result of this, he will fall down into the fire of hell deeper than the distance between the east and the west. SubhanAllah. Now I want you guys to think, my dear sisters and brothers, if one word can take us down to the deepest fire of hell, you know, um, between the east and the west, imagine all these other things that we do and say, Audhu Billah. Imagine Allah does not forgive us for it because we are not sincere in changing, we're not sincere in trying, we're not sincere in actually following his rules about Hayya. And this can be found in the book of Bukhari and Muslim. So knowing this, we should all seriously be careful what we say and how we say it. We should be very mindful of everything that comes out of our mouths. And then once a believer realizes this, and once a believer can really understand it, then he or she, inshallah, will be very careful, not only in front of their children, but alone with their friends, with everyone around them. And I say this, and I've said this before, if you have friends or family members who have bad mannerism and they don't care about haya and they don't care, then maybe it's time that you don't hang around them. Maybe it's time you see them and you say, Assalamu alaikum, and that's great, but they do not stay close friends to you. And it's, it's a fact, you know, and it doesn't matter. Like, I love my family, but I love Allah more. So there's no way that I would take them um, as more important than my Lord. So it's really, really important to remember that, you know. And the Prophet Sallallahu said, obviously, a strong person is not a person who throws his adversaries to the ground. A strong person is one who contains himself when he's angry. And I've noticed that we become our worst, obviously, when we get angry. We become our worst. And we have to remember that we need to work on this and we need to contain ourselves and hold ourselves back and become our best. And it's funny because recently I actually said this um, hadith to my children and mashallah they've memorized so many hadiths so they use it against me when it's uh, proper for them, right? So all of a sudden one day um, my younger son Omar did something and I was like, oh my God, astaghfirullah. And I'm just like, and my older son said this hadith, remember the Prophet sallallahu said, a strong person is the one who contains himself when he's angry. And I'm like, yeah, I know. I'm really trying to contain myself for Allah. <laughs> my reaction was going to be totally different because of uh, what my younger son did. So it's really, really hard sometimes for us, but really, um, you know, good friends, um, good people around you, if they can remind you of this stuff, especially when you are upset, then inshallah, it's really going to um, make it easier and help you and, you know, again, bring you back to that path, because we all need to be reminded, inshallah. And I read somewhere this, um, that the different levels of hayat, the social aspect concerning others besides Allah. Normally these things come off in regarding with one's relationship with your family. For instance, a child not wanting to do something displeasing to his mother, or, his, or a wife not wanting to do something displeasing to her husband, or even a student who's careful about saying something incorrect in front of his teacher. Last but not least is a type of hayat which the believer becomes shy of themselves. This is when they reach the peak of their Iman. What this means is that if they do or say or see anything wrong or even commit the tiniest thing, they start to feel extremely bad and embarrassed or feel extremely guilty in their heart. This builds a high degree of self-consciousness and what it does is strengthens the believer's commitment to Allah subhanahu wa And it's really true, my dear sisters and brothers. I mean, we have to literally control ourselves in every aspect and including um, being able to, you know, what we see, right? What we see and and what we hear, and we I, we say it all the time, you know, in my home. It's like, um, I mean, even including movies or cartoons or whatever, you look at, you know, is this appropriate? And if you don't think it's appropriate, and if it's, I mean, again, for especially here in the West, I mean, if it's a, above rated G, it shouldn't be even watched, unless it's obviously, obviously a documentary or something where it might be PG due to the glory of the blood or this or that, but not due to language and, you know, bad scenes or anything like that. So you really, really, really have to be careful um, 
with what even what you see and what you bring into your home and constantly remind your children the same thing as well as other family members. And the best way to really do this is by your own actions, inshallah. So um, let's go to the next slide, bismillah. Um, and I'm going to talk about the um, story of Musa alayhi But before I begin that, I'm going to talk about uh, another hadith that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said. He said, and this is for the brothers, if a woman passes in front of you, lower your eyes until she has passed by you. If a woman passes in front of you, lower your eyes until she has passed by you. And this is very important because it really shows the respect that, you know, people have for not only their sisters in Islam, but for all women, and that it's not um, proper for us to be staring at people and doing that, you know. Because but we know, especially in the West, we think when people look at you and they stare at you, we think of them as perverts. You know, we don't think of them, oh, mashallah, this is a great thing. No, we're like, you know, what a pervert, I would be that, you know. So um, you, you really have to think of this. And it's the same thing, you know, um, lowering our gaze for, for the sisters. We don't need to look at the brothers. We don't need to be staring at them. I mean, you know, literally lowering the gaze is the best way for all of us, inshallah. So I'll talk about Musa alayhi salam's story and his lesson of modesty. After waiting for a long time in the queue, being only two females among the all males, Someone finally decided to help them. They were able to take their flock of sheep and goats um, home. Their father was old and had no brothers to do their outside chores. So being one of the most difficult tasks, drawing water from the well in order to water one's livestock was performed usually by men. A blessed day for them to come home early with fresh water. Their father was surprised about this early return. And when he inquired into the occurrences, his daughters told him that a man who seemed to be a traveler had helped them. The father asked one of them to seek the man out and invite him home. Upon returning to the well, the lady approached him shyly. When she was in earshot, she gave him her father's invitation so that he might, recomp he might recompense him for his help. He kept his gaze low to the ground as he replied to her, saying that he had done it for Allah's sake alone and required no compensation. However, realizing that this was Allah who had sent him help, he accepted the invitation. As she was walking ahead of him, the wind blew her dress a bit which revealed part of her lower leg. So he asked her to walk behind him and point out the way he should follow when he reached a fork in the um, footpath. So here they are, they're arriving to the house. The father presented him with a meal and asked where he was from. The man told him that he was a fugitive from Egypt. The daughters who had brought him home whispered to her father, Oh, father, hire him because the best of the worker is the one who's strong and trustworthy. He asked her, how do you know he's strong? She said, he lifted the stone lid of the well that cannot be removed except by many together. He asked her, how do you know that he's trustworthy? She said, he asked me to walk behind him so that he couldn't see me as I walked. And when I conversed with him, he kept his gaze low with shyness and respect. This was Prophet Musa, salam, with the mercy and blessings of Allah be upon him, who had run away from Egypt after killing someone by mistake. And the father of the girls was a God-fearing man from the tribes of Medan, a man who was sonless. But he had these two daughters. The verse in the Quran tells us the story stresses upon the manners of approaching Musa alayhi salam. So one of the two daughters came to him walking modestly, modestly. So, you know, it's one thing that we approach someone, but it's the way we approach someone, the way we talk, the way we hold ourselves um, with respect in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that everything moves forward, you know? And both the way she approached Musa alayhi salam about his care not seeing more of her than was needful at the you know, time, as well as the way he approached her was amazing, subhanAllah. Neither one of them had a chaperone, nor could people see what they did, yet they both conducted themselves with the utmost respect, with the utmost haya. And this was done only, only my dear sisters and brothers, out of fear for the one who sees everything. What was the outcome? The father proposed to Musa alayhi salam that he marry one of his daughters. Musa alayhi salam considered them a suitable marriage prospect. And he and his daughters also saw in him all the virtues a man needs as a mate for, you know, to be a mate for a woman, to consent for his guidance and nurture through life. So Musa alayhi salam accepted and was also hired for 10 years as help, with, um, as a shepherd, as help with the father. So I really want you guys to think about, especially for all the sisters and brothers who are not married, I want you to really think about, um, you know, at the end of the day when you do want to get married, what kind of person do you want to get married to? The kind of person that you want to get married to should be the kind of person that you are, inshallah, right? 
as Allah SWT tells us, we will be with those who are how we are. So if we're going to be immodest and we're going to do all this stuff, then don't expect a modest wife. Don't expect someone with haya and dignity and all that when you're not doing it. And I'll tell you, I know uh, unless you've obviously changed and you're coming to this path and you're doing it, mashallah, but don't expect that either way. And the same thing with the sisters. You know, if you're walking around and you're, you know, flaunting your stuff and you think you look really good and all that, and then don't go after the brother who's lowering his gaze and being modest because it's not, it doesn't make any sense. And don't expect your husband most likely to be like that because um, we get what we put in. So the kind of person we are, that's the kind of men we're going to attract. You know, and I always hear the sister, there's no good men out there, there's no good men. Yeah, there's very limited great men and very limited great women. But we have to keep saying, how good are we? Have we worked in ourselves? Is Allah happy with us? Because Allah needs to be happy with us to fulfill the other end for us, right? He needs to be real. And then we ask Allah to bring that person into our lives, inshallah. So very important to understand. So next slide, we're going to go into haya in our dressing. One of the most common questions raised by non-Muslims is, is that if a Muslim woman is mandated to wear hijab, then why is a Muslim man exempt from this obligation in Islam? Why? Well, the truth is that Muslim men are equally required to follow hijab. And the term hijab, it doesn't just refer to a scarf or a, you know, a big dress covering everything. But Islamically, in the broader sense, it encompasses modesty and chastity of men and women's garments and guarding one's gaze. So by guarding our gaze, we do not look at, not only check them out, but we do not walk towards them a certain way. We're not like, you know, running after them or laughing loudly or trying to, you know, get attention in any way, shape or form, right? And so, you know, society, however, has said hijab is a fabric that covers the head, but that's not really it. It's beyond that. So when we're talking about the brothers, right, you know, the way I look at it, I don't think the men should be wearing tight, you know, tank tops and tight shorts and tight pants and, you know, wearing these tight little tops. No, no. It doesn't matter if you're a brother or sister. You know, you should be wearing modest clothing. Wear longer shirts. Cover your behind. Wear looser pants. You know, behave in a manner where you're not trying to get attention as well. Because obviously when you're wearing certain clothing, you want that attention just as much as if the sisters were doing it. So it's important that we all follow this rule in the same way, you know. It's not like, oh, men can wear whatever they want and they can do whatever they want and, and we, they're just supposed to lower their gaze. No. Dignify yourself with your outer wear, just like sisters have to do it. And it's... Um, the more we dignify ourselves on the outerwear, the more, inshallah, hopefully, it will affect our iman, and we will lower that gaze, and we will be dignified from inside out, inshallah, right? So while a woman in Islam has a choice to earn money or not, men are required to financially support their families, right? So when the brothers are out there, you know, we know the dress code is from the belly button to the knees, right? However, nowadays we have jobs that you know, require you to wear beyond that. And you have clothing that is available more to you. So I would say just as long as you can also think of, you know, these are my, you know, private areas and I don't want people looking at me in the same way. I don't want them to think, you know, oh, he has a nice behind or a nice chest or a nice this or not. If you can think like that, my dearest brothers, then inshallah, you also follow that. And it's the same thing for the sisters. Hijab is not just wearing a little... Um, have scarf around your neck and wearing tight clothing. No, 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 no. It's beyond that. You have to literally, you know, it's not wear your hijab number one properly, but your clothing should be loose and not see-through, and it should be really, really not extremely colorful, and it shouldn't be attention grabbers. It should be nice and representing you in a beautiful way, but it shouldn't be, you know, and hijab is not wearing massive amounts of makeup. SubhanAllah, plucking the eyebrows. I mean, I think some hijabis are more beautiful than the models out there after they've done all this makeup and well, their clothes. I'm just like, wow. I mean, you could be like a model, <laughs> you know, it's like, and, you, and you could do them hijab. And that's not what hijab's about. Hijab is about to, you know, take that effect away. And I know this is going to be extremely hard for a lot of the sisters um, to do that, but really that is the goal. It's to not get into that level of... Um, you know, 
when you start, you know, give yourself goals. And I know it's not going to be easy day one to stop doing a habit, but you have to give yourself goals and you have to keep working towards your goals and slowly and slowly and slowly stay away from the things that are, um, you know, attention grabbers, you know. And um, it's important. Again, it's important to understand it and it's important to just keep reflecting on your relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and what you will do to change that. And again, another thing with the hijab as far as not only dressing, but it's, um, you know, we've got the dress code, we've got all this. And I know in the West this is like normal, but I've seen it even in Muslim countries now and I'm kind of disappointed. But it's the men and women shaking hands or hugging each other that are not obviously their lahas. And that was a very big disappointment to me because obviously we know that this isn't appropriate. Right? We know the hadith of the Prophet. And so when we're talking about haya and modesty, we need to remember that it's not just our clothing for the sisters or the brothers are lowering our gaze, but it's the, our whole lifestyle. We need to be able to put, it, or put ourselves, you know, have that boundary that we don't touch the opposite gender who's not our maha. You know, we don't not only shake their hands, but we don't hug them or kiss them on the cheek or anything like that. We give ourselves that boundary and make sure that they are aware that we cannot do this stuff. This is part of our haya. This is part of our um, behavior. And it's not just from the clothing, but, you know, inside out, we have to go through that, inshallah. Allah. And as far as, you know, a lot of um, sisters are talk about as far as growing beards, the brothers growing beards, um, the situation, many of the scholars said it's, you know, it is a sunnah to grow the beard. And I think, um, mashallah, the brothers look amazing with it. And I think every brother should have it personally. But for those who don't, it's, you know, it's a sunnah. It's not fat. It's different, and it's um, some scholars have said that it's like wearing a niqab, the face coverings, and others hold it much more stricter. So um, personally, I think you know, if you could do that, it's a beautiful part of your haya. Again, you've got the beard, you've got the clothing, you're lowering the gaze. Inshallah, Allah, it just takes that you really love Allah and you're trying to follow the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. You know, okay. Um, so now we go to um, the next slide. Bismillah. Okay, so I'm going to go over a story about the Prophet وسلم, and the garden well. And what is respectable to view between people, of course, is very, right? So how much of a woman's body can be exposed to a husband is obviously much different from what she can expose to her brother, which in turn can be much different to what she can expose to a complete stranger and vice versa. This is true concerning what is permissible to see between the couples you know, um, of the same sex. So what a father, brother, or son can respectively view of each other is different from what a man outside the family circle is permitted to see, as well as what a, mo a mother, daughter, or sister can see of each other in contrast to a strange woman. So once the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, went into a garden, and he asked his companion Abu Musa al-Ashari to guard its gate. In the garden was a well, and he sat upon its wall, dangling his legs inside it. After a while, Abu Bakr him came, one intent to the garden. Abu Musa went to tell the Prophet وسلم, that his father-in-law wanted to share the garden with him. So the Prophet وسلم, said, tell him the good news, that the gardens of paradise await him and let him in. So Abu Bakr who went in to the garden and sat beside the Prophet وسلم, who was, whose serang was pulled up just above his knees and dangled his legs in the well with him. A little later, Umar who turned up. He wanted to relax in the garden too. Again, Abu Musa sought the Prophet ﷺ's permission for him, informing him of another one of his father-in-law's presence at the gate. He said, tell him the good news of the garden of paradise that await him and let him in. So at this time, Umar comes in as well, and he sits on the other side of the Prophet ﷺ. And um, he dangled his leg in the water next to him as well. Both of these men had the sensitivity to sit next to the Prophet ﷺ. And thus, the Prophet ﷺ was able to preserve prop, um, a proper positioning without having to pull his lower garment over his knees. Well, sometime after that, his son-in-law, Uthman ibn Affan, came in. And he, at that time, he was married to his daughter, Ruqayya. And so he also sought entrance to the garden. And when Abu Musa transmitted the Prophet's message by saying, the gardens of paradise await you after some trials. So he told Uthman that the gardens of paradise await you after some trials. So Uthman who knew that he would be facing some fitna in his life. And so he let him in. Uthman observed that only, the only free space on the well was 
uh, the one of the three uh, walls that the Prophet and his father in laws were not occupying, which meant he might see more of the Prophet's leg than they. As he hesitated to sit, the Prophet وسلم, pulled his throne down over his knees, so Uthman anhu, took the place opposite of him. Islam teaches us that there are some parts of our body that should not be revealed in public. And the closer these parts are to one's private areas, the more they should be prohibited to reveal. Although all of these men who sit next to him were close family ties and friends, um, but still it's why he let his knees be seen. But when the apostles and thighs were said to be exposed, he took steps to hide them. So it's really, really important, my dear sisters and brothers, that we think about this, um, not only for ourselves, but even for our children. We need to dress our children appropriately, whether they're girls or boys. I mean, after they turn, personally, my personal thing is after they can start walking and all that, I, I, I honestly think you really have to think about what they wear outside. There's so many child molesters out there. There's so many perverts out there. Even kids. <laughs> Just a moment. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> That's my two-year-old who knows I'm giving a speech and thinks that it's time for me to hold her on the left. So she ran out of the room, even though they had a a good plan for her and teaching her. Alhamdulillah. Okay, inshallah, everything will be okay. All right, this is the So um, I lost. Um, okay, so basically coming back to the point is that even with your children, you know, um, sh sh teach them how you at an early age. Show them not to look at the pictures or uh, movies or things that are inappropriate. Help them not look and stare at people of the opposite gender or even the, if they're the same gender wearing inappropriate clothing. Help them, you know, um, think about, you know, um, think about these things at a, young, at a young age. And I know, mashallah, with us, like... Um, you know, we've been working on our older children, and now that Asya, our younger one, two years old, she, even her, like, if she sees a picture that's, that she's like, oh, ugly, astaghfirullah, astaghfirullah, you know, and she'll lower her gaze, and she'll try herself. And it's uh, really beautiful, because now, mashallah, sometimes she'll say, mom, you know, I want to wear my hijab outside, and I'm like, are you sure you want to wear it? She's like, yeah. And she'll wear it for a few minutes, and then she'll be like, it's hot. <laughs> she'll take it back off. But the idea is that she understands it, and she knows it, and she we, you know, gets to see it and she's explained to it. Um, uh, so, you know, while they're young, you know, obviously they, may, you know, have their own things, but just teach them what's proper and what's not. You know, they don't need to wear as, you know, even two-year-old Daisy Duke shorts and bikinis and sewing suits. Like, they don't need to wear that. They should have haya even in themselves. So if you start them off with haya at a young age, then inshallah that will continue as they get older and they will themselves guard their chastity, inshallah. So really, really important to even help us to teach our children. So um, point number three, hayat and our behavior. Okay, um, Eliza Wajal says in chapter 24, verse 30, tell the believing men to lower their gaze and be modest. That is pure for them. Lo, God is aware of what they do. And tell the believing women to lower their gaze and be modest. And to display of their adornment, only that which is apparent, and to draw their veils over their chest, and to not reveal their adornments. So, you know, we read the Sayyat of the Quran, and obviously, subhanAllah, it tells the brothers first, but it also tells the sisters, you know, um, to lower your gaze, you know, and dress properly. I mean, it's really simple. If you don't want men to treat you like an animal, then don't dress like it. And I hate to say this, then I know we should have respect, and I know they shouldn't. But unfortunately, we are creatures of, um, you know, we are made in certain ways, and there are certain things that they have, um, the brothers have, that make them, you know, have different feelings and certain things for women. And so that's why Eliza Ojal has asked us to be more modest. And so it's very, very important because remember, animals follow their instincts without feeling any shame or sense of right or wrong. So. If we are going to say we're at a higher level, then we should be able to really, really, really implement this, you know? The more modest we are, the closer we are to being a human being. Islam has mandated so many legislations which induce the sense of modesty within human beings, you know? And 
distancing yourself, entering from different rooms, you know, the, even everything we do, and all of this has to do with haya, mashallah, you know. So I advise all of you guys to be shy towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the same way you're shy towards someone you really respect that's pious and righteous, you know. And as from this Quranic verse that we read, you know, um, it's not just about virtuous women, obviously, but it's for men as well, and that, like I said, they too have to dress in a certain way and hold themselves in a certain way, you know, and while it feels like women have a higher, you know, um, they have a higher, like, people feel like they have more on their shoulders with dressing modestly, it does reflect, reflect all of it. But when you really think about it, my dear sisters and brothers, right, about, like, example, an example of the predator and the prey, right, and their relationship, right? You have to think that the prey which is hidden escapes being a victim. The prey which is hidden, right? And so it's not to say anyone has a right to do anything head on to women or to do this or that, but we do have to control ourselves as well. We have to put ourselves in proper situations. We don't walk around at 2 in the morning, even with your hijab, and walk around at 2 in the morning thinking, okay, nobody's going to hurt me. No, you obviously have to think logically and intelligently, and you have to think smart at all the time because you know, you have to put yourself, and at the same time, you know, for the brothers, it's the same thing. You know, they have to constantly have this thing of they see sisters, lower your gaze. It doesn't matter if they're Muslim or not. You lower your gaze. And the way to really develop modesty is to think about whether um, you, like the female or the male, would sin the way they're doing it in front of their parents. Would you do this in front of your parents? And if you have one shred of shame in your heart, and that you would, you would not commit this kind of act in front of your parents. So if you couldn't commit this kind of act in front of your parents, then how can you do it in front of Allah Izza wa Jal? How? SubhanAllah. Isn't Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala worth so much more? And so Islam really wants us to consider this hayya of a believer in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to be a much greater and higher than in front of people. And obviously, you know, um, deeds are based on intentions, right? You know, whether we get good deeds or bad deeds. So really make your intentions clear of why you're not doing it, you know? And the Prophet Sallallahu said, Allah is more deserving than other people of your shyness. And early Muslims used to say, be shy towards Allah when you're in private in the same way you're shy in front of people when you're in public. And another one of their saying is, do not be devoted to the name of Allah in your public behavior. But when you're with the enemy, which is shaitan, to him when you're in the enemy in private, then you do whatever you want. Don't be of those people. Learn to control yourself at all times, inshallah. Okay, and then we've got Bismillah. The story of the Prophet ﷺ and rebuilding of the Kaaba. The modesty of the Prophet ﷺ may be, may the mercy of Allah be upon him, was the most prominent trait of his personality. Even from an early age, his sense of shame in an open society of the Arabs prior prior to Islam coming into his life was amazing, my dear sisters and brothers. One time in his life, after the treasures had been stolen from the inside, the people were rebuilding the Kaaba with a roof in order to prevent thieves from entering it again. So Muhammad وسلم, while he was still a young man, took part of it. He went with his uncle Al-Abbas to carry blocks of stones. His uncle told him to put the sarang around his neck to protect himself from sharp edges of the heavy rocks. As he وسلم, moved to comply with this sensible advice, he was overcome with dizziness, and he collapsed in a dead faint. His eyes gazed fixedly skywards as he lay on his back on the ground. His sarang loosened, but still covering his privates. A few moments later, he came around yelling, My clothing! My clothing! Hastily, the Prophet وسلم, wrapped the sarong securely around himself again. Never again in his life would anyone outside the family ever even catch a glimpse of his lines. So, my dear sisters and brothers, this story demonstrates to us, and it was told by one of the Prophet وسلم's companions, that the Prophet وسلم had a strong sense of shame he had a strong sense of shame in the covering his body. It was ingrained in him even before prophethood. He was known to be more modest than even a virgin before, both before and after re um, receiving revelation from Allah. And you think about it, my dear sisters and brothers. As a young kid, he was like this. Don't you think that we should teach our children haya as a young children? As a young kids, we should teach the boys and the girls how to dress and how to behave and how to look and how to act. And only then, inshallah, would we be able to 
understand all of it. You know? Um, so with that being said, inshallah, I am done and ready for questions. I apologize that we began a little late today. Um, we had some technical difficulties, but inshallah, and then we can begin the Q&A session now. And can we go from there? Okay. So, let's see. Is it allowable for a woman to not cover their heads or wear night clothes in front of their father-in-laws on the basis that they're non-Muslims? For a woman to not cover their heads or wear night clothing in front of yeah. Um, Father-in-laws, you know, that's a really good question. I think, uh, you know, that's something to ask the scholars. Um, and I'm a student of knowledge, so I don't want to answer this one. But if you email me, inshallah, I can ask the shuh and I can send it back to you. If you email me at, um, via Facebook, inshallah. Um, personally, myself, I cover in front of anyone that's non muslim to me. But Allah knows best as, father, as far as the father-in-law goes, you know, um, because to me, it's, you know, I don't know, I, I think modesty, again, I don't want anyone besides my husband or my own brothers or my own father. Be, beyond that, it's like, I think it gets really crazy, you know, or if their ki the kids are really young. Um, so, a good question. Email me, inshallah, and I will definitely ask the sheikh about this one for you. Okay. Is it permitted for a girl to deliver a speech in public where the audience consists of male, female, and it's not compulsory, it's just a competition? It depends on who you ask. It depends on where you're living and who you ask. Um, as far as I know, you know, uh, it, for myself, like when I'm doing dawah, I asked obviously Dr. Bilal Phillips and others if it was permissible for me, being a female, to go on stage and be able to give talks in front of men and women um, about Islam and all this. And Dr. Bilal, as well as several other sheikhs, told me it is as long as I'm dressed appropriately, I speak in a dignified manner, I uh, know how to be. Obviously, I don't intermix in the sense of shaking hands or anything like that, and I just keep it very respectful, and it's my part of a da'i. So um, it just, you know, I, I guess this one really depends on the situation and where it's at in order for us to understand it more. Again, you can email me this question as well, and I can, and, but it needs way more details in order for them to answer it, because it seems very vague right now. Inshallah. Okay, um, bear with me. I'm going to the next question. Okay, let's see. Is it okay to look at the eyes of an interviewer of the opposite gender? Um, technically, you know, we're taught in the West that it's okay to do this kind of stuff and to look people straight in the eye and all that. But if you can avoid it, it's better not to. It's better to lower your gaze. And um, even when you're going to the interview, you could tell them, you know, this is part of our modesty or haya and explain to them. Like, you know, I usually, when I meet people at the opposite gender, I tell them that we don't shake hands. And, we, and every once in a while, you may look up, but I think um, it may be better to mostly keep lower your gaze. That's my personal perspective on this. Um, many people would probably agree or tell you to not even go to an interview alone with the opposite gender. Maybe there should be a female in the interview as well, and you can keep looking at her and once, once in a blue moon get, gaze at the other interviewer. More details regarding the relationship between Haya and Iman. Okay, um, that's that would be too long of a conversation, Sister Samia. Maybe we can have another talk on that, inshallah. <laughs> okay, um, let's see. Just like ahead and way Nowadays in college and universities, it is sometimes very necessary to interact with the opposite gender. How should we maintain modesty in such cases? Um, really, you know, lowering your gaze and. Um, Talking to them only when you need to, not more than that. You know, you whether it's your professors, whether it's your classmates, you know, and when the time comes and you have to pick partners, trying to pick partners that are the same gender as you, so you don't have to go into those situations. So when you keep asking Allah to make it easy for you, Allah, I really want to have modesty and haya. Please make it easy for me. I'm trying my best, and then you work on it, and Allah will make it easy for you. Believe me, if you really want it and you really want to change, Allah will make it simple amazingly easy for you, inshallah. Is it permissible for a woman to deliver a public lecture? I answered this question. Um, I, I said, if obviously, the shuh told me as long as she dressed properly in hijab, voice is proper, mannerisms proper, not um, obviously, you know, doing the wrong stuff, and as long as the lecture is obviously retaining to, you know, 
good stuff, I guess, inshallah. And it's not all men, you know, audience and stuff like that. So it, it all really depends. But as far as I know, um, as far as she's dressed properly, wearing proper clothing, and she keeps herself in a dignified manner and all that, and it's fine. Some of the shirks say, especially um, if it's for dawa, obviously, but you just have to really know your intentions and why you're doing it. When I usually travel, my mahram was always with me. So my husband's always with me, alhamdulillah, whether I'm in country or out of country. And I always have him by me, so alhamdulillah. Is it mother-in-law and son-in-law? Are they mahrams? That's a very good question. <laughs> you know, um, hmm. I don't, I don't know this one, to be honest with you. Are they mahrams? As, because as far as I know, I mean, when you get that close, your mother-in-law and father-in-law are supposed to be um, very close to you, and you're supposed to be like your mother and father. But I think, you know, depending on their age and all that, I think they should always have that high-end modesty between them personally, you know, and have that respect of, you know, not getting too close. And Allah knows best. And again, email me this question as well. I'm a student of knowledge, so you guys will have to bear with me. I do take classes on Islamic studies, but this question, I mean, I know that, you know, your in-laws become like your parents and all that, but um, I personally don't feel comfortable to be a certain way in front of mine. So what's true and what you feel comfortable is different, you know. And so you can just email me this question. I'll ask this one as well, inshallah. What is your email ID? You, if you go to um, my Facebook page, you can just send an email from there. Message me on Facebook. That'll be the best one because my inbox is way too cluttered and crazy. Okay, so like a mashallah, good lecture. Question on how we behave with people of the same gender, like me being a girl, what type of haya should I maintain with other girls? Want to know what is not said. Um, you should still have haya. You shouldn't still, you know, you shouldn't have like, um, you know, you shouldn't be crazy. And I, I'm going to tell you, a few years back, I like to say, I'm reflecting now, maybe 17, 18 years back in my own life, you know, I went to an all-girls party, and they were all um, the same gender, and it was all women and all that. And I, I would be like, kid you not, these girls were, like, dressed inappropriately and talking about inappropriate stuff, and it was just ridiculous at how far they had gone with inappropriateness. And they thought just because there was no men, they could do this kind of stuff. And I was just so disgusted by this. So um, I don't think, you know, you go to an all-girls party, you should be wearing, like, um, a bikini or or, or a, um, you know, any anything that's not appropriate. Um, so I think it's really important that you contain yourself to that level of modesty. So for myself personally, if I went to an all sisters party, all women party, I mean I I don't even honestly feel comfortable taking my hijab off. Like I like to be dressed the same way because I don't know if people have cameras and they're gonna take pictures or this or that. I like to just um, I feel more comfortable just being that in that state in case someone, you know, doesn't have so um that, you know, that, but as far as I do, I do know that you know you could obviously um, be a little bit more freer, but you shouldn't be at that point where um, you're, you know, like you just think it's free. Oh my, I can do whatever I want. I can go swimming in a bikini because it's all girls party. I don't think that that's appropriate at all. You should have modesty and haya in front of a woman as well. Okay, the adequate to participate in class in the university. I'm a very enthusiastic student. I tend to participate a lot in class. That's good, inshallah. I think that's that's not a bad thing as long as you know your intention of doing that stuff. Um, and, and as long as you keep your voice and your mannerism proper, I don't think that should be an issue, inshallah. Um, but don't be over-enthusiastic and over-happy because that might lead some people to get the wrong misconception about you. So it's just a matter, a matter of judging yourself. And you, you know yourself, but obviously, um, better than we can tell you. How should I talk to my husband about being modest and to lower his gaze? Bring these ayats to him, explain to him that it's part of uh, our lifestyle. Maybe help him get better clothing for himself. I mean, Haya starts in several different ways. You know, I like you can get him nice longer shirts and this and that. And explaining to him, you know, that it's important that Haya is between the sister and the brother, not just one or the other, and his relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
how can I bring up kids Islamically? Um, well, it all depends on how old your children are, first of all. But really, uh, you, if you apply Islam in your life and everything that you do, it's very not very difficult to bring up your kids in the Islamic way, mashallah. Like right now, we have um, our two-year-old Asiya, mashallah. You know, she recites Ayat al-Kursi, she recites Quran, she recites Surahs, she prays with us, and that's because that's just our way of life. We do all this stuff, mashallah, you know. So it's very simple for her to get these, you know, this is part of her life. So I think, you know, it's how, what you do with, in your life and what you're doing in your spare time to really reflect on how they will be, inshallah, as well. What is the aura of a daughter in front of her mother and vice versa? Um, it, I think, you know, personally, it depends because obviously if you're a mother and you're nursing or you're doing certain stuff, I think, um, you know, it's fine, and also between a mother and a daughter, or a father and a son, depending on if you're sick and you need to see certain parts of the body and all that, you know, and the mother needs to help the daughter. I think it's different. I think that sh they should be fine. There shouldn't be anything. But on a normal daily basis, I don't think the daughter should be walking around in a, you know, bikini and saying, "Hey, mom, how's it going?" No. Only out of necessity do I think. Um, you know, and I believe the scholars have said, the ulama have said that it's fine out of necessity to help take care of um, them should they need it because they're sick. Okay. All right. You guys are asking a lot of questions, Mashallah. So bear with me as um, I'm trying to kind of, I, I got lost in the questions. Let's stop on the question, asking the questions really quick so I can, because it went down now I can't find it until then. Oh my goodness, <laughs> mashallah, hold on. <laughs> okay. Okay. There is an ayah saying that women should cover their bosoms, not their heads. How did women interpret this to mean their heads, breasts are quite different? Obviously, Sister Katarina, that's true. But the hadith of the Prophet said everything should be covered except your hands and your face. So that obviously tells us your hair is part of that. And obviously hair beautifies us and makes us look so much, you know, more beautiful than just um, covering our chest. And you know, that's part of a woman's beauty, and so Allah knows best. But the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu brings that into effect. Is it okay if you choose not to work because the environment is mixed with both male and female? Absolutely. If you don't need to work, absolutely. There's no, I mean, only if you need to work, then you should. But if you choose not to, there's no issue with it. Why not? You should be happier being at home studying, taking care of your family, your kids. There's so many other things we could do at home as well. And it could help the community in many ways. Wearing cat scarf is enough for sisters have to wear abayas? Um, I would say it's best to, it doesn't have to be an abaya, but it's best to dress in modest ways. And for myself personally, I think cat scarf and an abaya is the most comfortable. And it's the most comfortable. I can freely walk, freely move around, freely do things. Um, but again, it's it doesn't have to be that abaya. You could wear a long shirt up to your knees, for example, and loose pants or a loose skirt underneath it, you know, um, with a long shirt. So you could have other clothing. It just has to be, you know, loose and nice and um, comfortable and making you look like a sister. But at the same time, you know, it doesn't have to be just an abaya. Welcome. For a woman, how should she dress in front of her father or brother? What is the criteria? Um, you shouldn't wear tight clothing even in front of your father or brother, number one. Number two, um, I think, you know, short sleeve would be, Personally, that would be the the most I would go. Like I wouldn't wear a tank top or anything, but short sleeves, a loose like a loose T-shirt that maybe size medium large. You know, if you wanted to wear a T-shirt with pants at home, um, you could probably wear capris. I mean, but I think that would be the most. I don't. I mean, it's how comfortable you are. But I'd say don't go beyond. My father hates capris. He hates even like a little bit of your feet showing, whether that's my, you know, sister or myself or any of us. We don't wear it anyways, but he dislikes it so much. And so, subhanAllah, um, you, you kind of got to see what they said. But as far as, you know, Islamically, it would be, you know, wear loose clothing. Yes, you don't have to cover your hair. Your, I mean, elbow down, that's okay, you know. But nowhere, like, again, no tank tops, no tight stuff, no... Uh, and depending on the, how close you are, I mean, if you, Caprice would be my limit, I think, even with my father and brothers. I'm a girl, and I look at sisters' dresses or how they wear hijab when they pass by 
Um, is it against Haya? Is it against? No, I think if your intention is clean, you just want to look at how they do it, maybe to learn something from them, or um, you know, to get ideas and all that, or you think it's beautiful, mashallah, because they're your sisters in Islam. I don't think that's bad. But if your intentions are something else, then Allah knows best. Okay, what's the way in talking to our sister's husband, who's 15 years older, and like our brother? Um, the same way you would talk to someone who's not mahram, in a very respectful, polite way, but you keep your distance, you um, try to lower your gaze as often as you can, and you just answer their questions and keep it right to business. You don't get closer than that. Uh, how to avoid shaking your hand with women if you're participating in some official events? What would be the best words to say if this is already raised. I would say, you know, I would put my hand, the way I personally do it, and I've met, subhanAllah, many celebrities in the U.S., many famous people who, I mean, that's all they want to do is hug you or shake your hand because they're so excited. And I put my hand on my chest and I'm saying, I'm sorry, um, it's a modesty thing, but we don't shake or hug the opposite gender who's not our immediate family, like our fathers or brothers. I explain it to them. Right there, I explain to them. And so they get in, they understand, they're like, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't know. I'm like, it's okay, it's all right, now you know. So I would explain, if they want to have more knowledge, then guess what, the whole topic comes up, and mashallah, you know, you go for them. Is the face cover a must in Islam? Uh, no, it's recommended, it's not a must. Um, the must is only your face and hands can be shown, but the niqab is uh, recommended. Some minor scholars say it's a must, but the majority say it's not a must. Hijab is only covering everything except showing your face and your um, hands. Okay, bismillah. Okay. They are your mahram, but haya is also yeah. Okay, I don't know what that was for. So Mike, a few months back I wrote to Islam, mashallah, welcome to Islam. My family and friends don't know about this, so I dress the way I used to with slight changes. Um, though, I know it's wrong, please guide me in this. Um, Sister um, Aisha, Message me on Facebook, and inshallah, Tala, we'll have a we'll talk about this. Message me on Facebook. This this could be a longer conversation. So message me on Facebook, inshallah, Tala, and I'll see how I can help. Okay. Um, actually, concerned the ayah, the words hamad is used. Hamad means headscarf, but let the sister answer. Okay. Um, my sis, I think you should make them aware and know about it. Okay. Is it compulsory to cover the face? We answered this one. I try to have modesty in my hijab by wearing only white hijab, but it's with a good and attractive one. Yes, yeah, covering, but it's attractive wherever I go. I see others looking for the way I dress because it really makes me different. Sometimes I really don't get their attention. Um, they say that, I mean, the best colors for hijabs in a bio is usually are the darker colors, the browns, the blues, the blacks, the grays. Um, those are the ones that it's you know, keep attention and stuff away. So that's what they're saying, um, what, it, what is recommended. So maybe you might want to try a different color, sister. You know, a darker color, see how that works for you. Okay. Um, why in peace conference where, mashallah, all the nine sheikhs gather, there's no female speaker invited. <laughs> there's no hijab, a voice for women, and even the scholars who take niqab also but are not given any recognition on stage. Uh, I have no clue. I think, inshallah, maybe in the future they might change that. But right now, maybe there's just so many great speakers, mashallah, you know, they don't have the time for that. Okay, yeah. Is music allowed in all sisters' nikah instruments or no instruments? This is, this is a very, um, what's the word? Very, I'm trying to think of the proper word, but debatable question. Um, in an all-women's party and all that. Usually, if it is, you know, some of the scholars who say it is allowed, it's definitely not allowed with instruments. It's just allowed voice and people to just kind of have fun, uh, but no instruments regardless, you know? And just the duff, the drum, basically. Um, you know, um, as far as do people do it or not? I mean, in the past, in the time of the Prophet Sallallahu you know, in happy occasions, they did sing and people did, like, play the duff and they had fun, you know? Um, but it's not the way people do it now. Now it's like, subhanAllah, 
people just listen to whatever they want to, there's just garbage on there, and they just think it's okay if there's no men, we can do what we want, and that's not appropriate as well. It is a big blow that you have to deal with rejection, disappointment may come, deal with. Rejection, disappointment may come, but until you overcome them, you will always hide your true identity. Okay, I'm not sure what that was, but alhamdulillah. Can a Muslim sister wear a short skirt or dress in front of other sisters? I wouldn't recommend wearing, recommend wearing short, short skirts in front of other sisters, or even dressing in front of other sisters, unless you have no choice and you have to. Again, that's part of Haya. Like, I personally like to be covered all the time unless I have no choice. I don't even like to go to the, my closet and change with my two-year-old. I feel embarrassed in front of her. So I think it just kind of goes um, with, you know, your thing. But I don't think, you know, if you have no choice, it's one thing. But I think that is part of our Haya is dressing alone as well as, you know, not wearing short skirts and all that. I mean, I personally hate to attend an event which is all females and they're dressed inappropriately. I'm like, I don't want to see your legs, I don't want to see your chest, I don't want to see your back, I don't, I don't want to see your stuff either. Save it for your husband. I don't. And so I think it's um, important that we understand that other sisters don't really care to see that stuff either, you know. Okay, please do restrict your questions to be relevant to the topic. Okay. All right, so that's all the questions I have. If there's any other ones, I'll answer them now, or else we can finish up, inshallah, because I did ask you guys to stop because I, I couldn't catch up. <laughs> but now I caught up, alhamdulillah. When you are doing a workshop, when are you doing a workshop on homeschooling? Inshallah, soon when our homeschooling launches, I'll be doing many workshops on homeschooling. Um, right now, I don't have anyone asking to do a workshop on homeschooling, so I haven't really done it. I usually do those live when people ask me to do it. Can you show the feet? Oh, okay, well then, well. Can you show the feet? It is highly recommended not to. It's highly recommended to wear socks. Um, it's better. Um, but I do know that sisters show it, so that it's highly recommended not to. Is it compulsory for men to wear a cap when, they, when going to the mosque? No, it is not compulsory for a brother to wear a cap when going to the mosque or anywhere else. If they choose to wear it, alhamdulillah, if they don't, alhamdulillah, the Prophet never gave a, or the Sahaba never gave anything indicating that they have to wear it. And Allah knows best. I'm a girl and I look at sister's dresses or had it. Okay, we already talked about this. Can we look at women if they're in proper hijab? I, I believe so. I mean, as long as your intention isn't anything bad, yeah, there's not, no reason. I think only lesbians would be in, I would be lying in this case where they shouldn't be looking at women even if they're in proper hijab. But I think if there's nothing wrong with, um, you know, I mean, you, you can look at your sister, your best friend, and all that. I don't think nothing's wrong with that. Have his proper clothing. And wayakum for men, should they keep their garments above ankle? Yes, 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 yes. This is there's a hadith of the Prophet that said, if your pants are uh, below your ankle, then you, it's going to be in the fire of hell. Even for myself. Like I'm trying to get my boys' pants the same way. I'm trying to get them into the habit where I'm getting them shorter pants or I'm going to have to cut it and sew it that way. And I've been working on this with my husband. It's very important that it be above the ankle. We're not here to impress society. We're here to impress Allah. So if people think it doesn't look good, that's nice. Where will be the recording? I don't know. You'll have to ask the sisters um, who put this together, mashallah. Is it okay for a Muslim woman to rescue in public? No. No, 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 no. I'm a, I'm a, I'm big against anyone breastfeeding in public. I think um, if you have no choice and you're covered really good, maybe. Um, but I highly recommend people do it in the car, you know, or in the house or the hotel room or whatever. But not just go to a restaurant. Okay, I'm hungry. I'm gonna eat and feed. No, I don't know. I, I'm big against it. And, I, and I'm in the West. When I was um, going on speaking tours, because I travel in the U.S. with my family, and when I would go on speaking tours, when I had Asia, who's not too much of us and I had to nurse her, I would do it in the car, or I would do it in my hotel room, but I would never like just go out in public. I don't know, I think that's, I get part of Haya not to do it in public, and Allah knows best. My, that's my thing. Okay. And questions are almost ended, so this is the last one, let me ask. Answer, how can, okay, so can, so as a girl, can I wear loose pants? Yes, as long as your shirt is long enough to like, let's say knees, and, you know, you, you can tell that you're a girl, not a boy. You know what I mean? So your clothing has to look like a female clothing, not men. Okay, last question. How can we avoid um, 
shaking hands with opposite gender, non-Muslims, how can we explain to them without hurting their feelings? Very easy, Sister Shefna, very easy. I do it all the time. I go on, I meet a lot of people all the time. I go on the planes. I go on um, wherever I'm going, you know, at these big events. The, when the men come up to me, hi, Zora, how are you? And I say, I'm sorry, it's a modesty thing. We don't shake hands with the opposite gender. And I explain it, you know. And um, it's, it's, you just have to keep learning to explain it, and it's a really nice thing because they learn that modesty is not just from your outerwear, but it's from your habits and your character and your actions. You know, like we're avoiding fitna. Of, we're saying we don't want to be, you know, looked as a sex object, so we need to avoid it in every way we can that the Prophet has taught us to. And by following his sunnah, subhanAllah, that it really does change it tremendously, mashallah. You know, and, and people look at you differently than they look at uh, people who don't because you have you have limits to everything you do. And our limits and our boundaries are there because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told us these if you follow these limits and these boundaries, then inshallah you will not be hurt. You will be fine. And so we're following it to the best of our ability to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so at the end of the day, inshallah we don't go the wrong path, inshallah. And believe me, it's much respected once you start sharing with people. When you don't become shy or nervous about it and you're really upfront and honest, people do have a big sense of respect. And I mean, I know guys will say, oh, the hand on the heart is better than the hand, being a handshake. And they'll start saying all these kind of compliments and stuff. And it's like, you know, they, they start to get it. And so there's nothing wrong with it. You just have to be honest and upfront with it, inshallah. Okay, with that being said, I'm going to say the closing of dua, inshallah. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdika nashadu an la ilaha inta nastakhrika wa natubu ilayk. How perfect you are, O oh Allah, and we praise you. None has a right to be worshipped except you. We seek your forgiveness and turn in repentance to you. Jazakallah khairan and assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.